So this leads on into our next speaker. Um, our next speaker, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce, is uh, Professor Martin Hoffert, um, who is a professor of physics at NYU. He is the um, founder of the Earth Systems Group, which is affiliated with that department. Um, he is um, has degrees in, um, actually, um, I think Dr. Hoffert has four degrees in, in both aerospace engineering, um, doctorate, um, bachelor's degree from University of Michigan, uh, doctorate and master's from, I believe, Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute in Aeronautics and Astronautics. He also has an MA uh, from in uh, Social Science from the New School for Social Research in New York City. Um, he has done extensive work in alternative energy sources, solar power satellites, and global climate change. He is a member of the IPCC, which I if I remember the acronym, is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, he is also my professional mentor and the inspiration behind my work on solar power satellites, so I'm pleased to introduce Professor Marty Hoffer. Would you like to see It's really wonderful to be introduced by a former student. That's really great. Um, what I'd like to speak about is uh, to follow on some of the ideas that Seth was introducing uh, regarding low mass solar power satellites and uh, solar power satellites in low Earth orbit. But before I do, I, I, I just like to touch on some of the political and social implications of, uh, of space power. Uh, it's, we live in an age now where a number of scientific issues have become increasingly politicized. The one that I work on, sort of my major bread and butter, and global warming has become extremely political because of the implications of global climate change. Uh, there, there seems to have developed a situation where uh, political conservatives believe that global warming is a kind of um, almost liberal conspiracy to transfer large amounts of income to developing countries uh, uh, paid for by US taxpayers, perhaps. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for this, I think, is that it's characteristic of these problems that when one begins to look at what would be necessary to mitigate uh, global warming, should it become a, a serious issue, and that's another question, whether it is or not, uh, if we look at the population dynamics seriously, uh, by the year 2050, uh, something like 95% of the world's population growth is going to come from developing poor countries, mainly in the tropics, and 75% of the increased carbon emissions from increasing energy use are also projected to come from those countries according to the most likely scenarios of the IPCC. And there, there are very important political questions about how that's going to happen uh, and what, what can be done to mitigate it. So I actually would like to try to lay out a scenario for the development of space power that has elements that I think would be appealing to both political conservatives and to political liberals. Political conservatives hopefully would be attracted to a scheme that takes advantage of entrepreneurial um, activity that would stem from existing world businesses. Uh, basically, just quickly, uh, the, our idea is to try to develop an infrastructure of global space power generation from an existing infrastructure, one that is about to be vastly expanded in global communication satellites. Many of you are probably aware that a number of companies are planning to put large numbers of high bandwidth communication satellites into low and medium Earth orbit. Uh, the company Teledesic, well, which uh, was founded about a year or two ago and includes Bill Gates as one of the, the, the funders, uh, has a system on the boards that uh, may have as many as 700 satellites. Um, and, and, and when you're talking about investments that large and systems of, of, uh, that will be deployed in space with that many satellites, uh, our concept basically would be to integrate solar power delivery with, so, with global communications delivery. In effect, to create a new industry of global electric power delivery from orbit that would be integrated with a global communications industry. 
Uh, the other concept, of course, is to, uh, to, to try to deal with what I at least believe is, is going to be the major problem of the 21st century environmentally, uh, which is the potential for the destruction of biological diversity in tropical countries and the alteration of the Earth's climate. Uh, and, and that too will require uh, a, a response that might uh, very profitably come from solar power satellites. So let me just start with some uh, material about the global, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is a, 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 this is a treaty that was signed in Rio in 1992, uh, which basically the most important part to us is Article 2 uh, of that treaty, which has the objective of stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent the dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system without defining dangerous yet. And also such a level should be achieved in a time frame to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to climate change, ensure food production isn't threatened, and enable economic development to proceed sustainably. Well, uh, some of this is not really the time to go into detail on the climate change part, but if we just look at the major greenhouse gas, CO2, the upper panel uh, shows the historical growth in CO2 emissions, mostly from fossil fuel burning, which are presently about six gigatons of carbon per year globally and with a global population of about six billion people, that means each of us produces about a ton of carbon per year. It's about five times more in the developing countries, five to 10 times more. Uh, there's also been a historical rise in the concentration of atmospheric CO2 from a pre-industrial level of about 270 parts per million to about 354 parts per million today, almost certainly due to the introduction of uh, carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning. That atmospheric rise represents about half the CO2 put in by fossil fuel burning. The rest of it is, is in the oceans uh, and is absorbed by the oceans. And one can model this with a carbon cycle model, which you can run either directly or indirectly, where you input the uh, rate of emissions and the model computes the atmospheric concentration change, all of the models that are used reproduce these historical trends. Now, the, one of the responses to the United Nations Convention has been to develop a set of so-called CO2 stabilization scenarios where according to some more or less legislated path, one approach is a constant concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere and, and the lower panel shows those concentrations 450, 550, 650, 750, uh, and there's also 1,000 ppm. Uh, there's also one that goes to 350 ppm, which is the current uh, concentration. Uh, there are no scenarios for going back to 270 ppm. Uh, this business, you do not regain your virginity. If we stopped all of our CO2 emissions, uh, we would not return to the pre-industrial concentration for uh, tens of, uh, excuse me, hundreds of thousands to millions of years because we've been basically perturbed the long-term geochemical equilibrium of the Earth. Um, well, if one looks at these various stabilization scenarios, it's possible to run the, uh, just bear with me for a minute on this, it's a little complicated, but not too bad. It's possible to run these carbon cycle models in an inverse mode, that is to say, you can specify the concentration distribution out into the next century that you were going to stabilize at and ask the question, what is the allowable emissions that would produce that? And that's what's shown in the upper panel. Uh, the top line, which is business as usual, uh, represents the best estimate by the World Bank and by various economists uh, as to what the emission levels would be corresponding to global energy consumption rises, and, and there's a lot of assumptions that go into that, but it's mainly population driven, and there's a certain assumption as to the ratio of carbon emissions to primary energy consumption. So there's an assumption about 
how the energy is going to be produced uh, and how much will be from fossil fuel. Well, uh, so we see starting at six and a half uh, gigatons a year, uh, stabilization, for example, at 550 parts per million represents, a, a allow, you're allowed to increase moderately and then you have to come back down again. Uh, if you wanted to stabilize at 350 ppm, the emission rates would actually have to become negative around the year 2065. That is something would have to, you'd not only have to stop burning all fossil fuel, but you'd have to start sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere to maintain that 350. Remember, 350 still is higher than 270 to the pre-industrial level. Well, let me just quickly run to the important graph, which is the lower one, which basically indicates the shortfall in terawatts, that is the difference in, in, in energy between what would be produced by business as usual and what you would be allowed to produce to maintain stabilization of CO2 at any of these levels. For example, the 550 ppm stabilization level in the year 200, uh, 2050 one would require approximately 15 terawatts of carbon-free energy worldwide in, in order to simultaneously meet the economic objectives of business as usual and reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide sufficiently to stabilize at 550. Now remember, 550 is twice the pre-industrial level. And current climate model projections indicate that two times CO2 will produce a global warming of between one and a half and four and a half degrees Kelvin worldwide with a number of impacts that might be considered deleterious eventual sea level rises but perhaps more serious changes in the global hydrological cycles and impacts on agriculture. So even two times CO2 uh, would not necessarily be free of danger um, and yet, just to meet that goal, which is which was obviously less than business as usual, would require more primary energy consumption from carbon-free sources than our present global energy consumption. As just to put this into context, we're presently uh, consuming about 12 or 13 terawatts globally. Of that, 80% is from fossil fuel sources. Approximately 10% is from what's called traditional renewables, which is mainly firewood. About 5% is uh, geothermal, I'm sorry, is, is hydro, hydroelectric. Uh, about 4% is nuclear. And less than 1% of all of the renewables, the so-called high-tech renewables, solar electric, solar thermal, wind energy, and so forth. Um, how is that situation going to change dramatically in the next 50 years? Remember that the first controlled nuclear reaction uh, produced by humans with occurred December 2nd, 1942 uh, under the squash courts at the University of Chicago Enrico Fermi's nuclear pile. That is as far in the past as 2050 is to us in the future. And at this point, we're still producing only of the order of four or five percent of our global energy from nuclear power. Uh, likewise, controlled thermonuclear fusion research has been going on for about 40 years. Uh, that's about how long ago the first hydrogen bomb exploded. And the best estimates for the first, um, if, if it can be done at all, uh, commercial fusion power reactor, which is going to be done through some international consortium, would be bit by approximately the second decade of the 21st century. So, the market penetration time, that's my point here. It's very important to develop commercial infrastructures that will allow this energy to be produced at, you know, in a timely way if it's gonna make any difference. One of the problems, of course, is that fossil fuel has made us um, rich and healthy, and it's very deeply embedded in our global economy. And what this uh, 
table shows is the top on the on the right hand side is is the um, are the multinational corporations the volume of business done by the largest multinational corporations on the left of the pre-industrial countries with the largest gross national product. And, and what you see is that multinational corporations basically do volumes of business comparable to the gross national product of the developing countries of the world. And that I put asterisks on the multinational corporations that are involved in the fossil energy business. And basically what is being conveyed here is that fossil energy is uh, so fundamental to the present workings of the global economy that it would be very difficult to dislodge. Um, now, also, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think this is important, it was alluded to by earlier speakers. This is a graph, just look at the top graph, showing the, on a logarithmic scale, oh, this is probably better. Uh, the the uh, vertical axis basically is per capita gross national pro product, gross domestic product versus per capita power consumption. The straight line represents a, a line of approximately 23 cents per kilowatt hour. That's the average amount of gross world product, or gross national product produced per unit of energy consumed. In other words, there's a, obviously a strong correlation between energy consumption and income produced within a nation and produced per capita. Um, in a sense, that curve, which always has a slope of one, uh, countries that are more efficient at producing income out of energy, for example, Japan and France, they might be able to get 46 cents or a factor of two more uh, gross national product per unit energy, and countries which are inefficient, uh, for example, the former Soviet Union countries like East Germany and Czechoslovakia and so forth, might be a factor of two below the curve. But the important thing is that there are two orders of magnitude of difference between the poor countries of the earth, the developing countries, and the developed countries, both in per capita income and in per capita wealth. And all of the developing countries are committed to increasing their per capita income at the same time that their populations are rising. And we've also heard, and, and I think the data bears out, that um, there's a relationship between population growth rates and income, the poor countries in general having higher uh, population growth rates. These are the crude birth rates. And you see, basically, at about $2,000 per person, something happens called the demographic transition, where having children is no longer seen as an economic asset. You start worrying about their college expenses and other costs that they're going to have, and, you, and the population uh, growth rate declines. Um, Let's see, there's, there's a lot more that can be said on this topic, but I want to try to focus now on some more SPS, specifically SPS-related issues that, that maybe haven't been developed that much yet. One of them is the issue of land use. Look at table, the table is called 4.4, and that just basically shows since the year 1700 how the area of the earth that might be disaggregated into forests and grasslands and deserts and croplands has changed. You notice there's been an enormous growth in the fraction of the Earth's area devoted to agriculture, to croplands. And basically that's come at the expense of forests and woodlands. And I think most of you are aware of the fact that in particularly the tropical developing countries, and we all hear about the uh, deforestation of the Amazon, for example, there's been a, an incursion into natural ecosystems simply associated with the fact that the uh, population of the Earth is growing. Um, and so there's already an important conflict between food production and the maintenance of biodiversity. Biological diversity is also very much related to the area available to natural ecosystems. And, uh, Seth mentioned last summer I visited uh, Kenya to uh, actually look at the game parks and so forth. And one of the things I was really struck by 
was the fact that this is a country where uh, all the available land is cultivated. Uh, the population is growing. And the conflict is between the preservation of natural ecosystems, in the case of Kenya, the, national, the, the natural parks where uh, all of those great animals live that you see on Wild Kingdom, uh, and, and the uh, needs of the population. Now, uh, people who talk about renewable energy, um, particularly biomass, for example, but even terrestrial solar, don't always take into consideration that you now have an additional conflict for land, not only is agriculture going to be competing um, with natural ecosystems, but it's going to be competing with low energy density terrestrial renewable energy. Now, our estimates are that biomass energy will produce approximately one watt per square meter of electrical energy. Uh, terrestrial photovoltaics might be of the order of 10 watts per square meter electrical. We believe that 100 watts per square meter electrical is achievable by, so, by solar uh, power satellites. And we have a particular route towards attaining that. But that factor of 10 could make an enormous amount of difference in land use. And it's not a, a, a piece of the argument that has been really developed that much. Uh, renewable energy, if we're going to have a worldwide renewable energy system, and that's, of course, what's implied by the IPCC studies of, of carbon-free energy, that we're going to need worldwide sources of energy comparable to our present fossil energy system, uh, means that we're going to have to be able to transmit the energy from where it's available to where it's needed uh, efficiently. There are various ways of doing that, not, unfortunately not enough. Uh, and uh, power beaming plays a role in that. Um, I guess the other factor is the low aerial power density of renewable energy. This is a graph uh, that basically compares the energy flux in watts per square meter for different energy sources and, and sinks. And uh, the renewables, wind energy, photosynthesis, terrestrial PV, and so forth, are generally orders of magnitude below what fossil energy, fossil fuel power plants produce. I mean, a boiler of a coal-fired power plant, for example, uh, might have a, a, a heat transfer rate of 10,000 watts per square meter compared to something like 100 watts per square meter collector, uh, you know, at a solar collector on the Earth. And the implications of that are enormous in terms of materials um, and land use, and, and all of that has to be taken into account. Now, finally, the, the question of cost, which constantly comes up in this business, it's very hard to pin down. Table 4.3 comes from a, a recent Department of Energy report for various types of renewable energy. Uh, it's purporting to indicate what the, co the present day costs are of geothermal ultra photovoltaics, 1990 costs. And according to this, uh, wind energy is nine cents a kilowatt hour, hydro is eight, wood fired electric is seven, geothermal is 5.5. Well, here in New York, where I actually live on Long Island, but both New York and Long Island have probably the highest electricity rates in the country. Uh, I'm paying about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. If these numbers are right, there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to get uh, cost-effective wind energy. But of course, there is no cost-effective wind energy because it has not, it is not available here, wherever else it might be available. The transmission systems of electric power are limited by the I squared R losses of power lines. And for that reason, we really do not have terrestrial transmission of electric power more than several hundreds of kilometers. Buckminster Fuller, back in the 80s, conceived of the idea of global transmission lines, transmission lines that would basically allow them to collect energy on the sunlit part of the Earth and utilize it on the dark side of the Earth. Um, and of course, that's a great idea, but when he was uh, still alive, the high temperature superconductors that might eventually make this possible have not yet been discovered. 
Um, so I think one potential path of global power, electrical power transmission might really be terrestrially through high temperature superconductors, and they might well be a system competing with solar power satellites at some point in the 21st century that is renewable, terrestrial renewables, transmitted worldwide by superconducting grids. Now, as far as uh, solar power satellites, what, we, what we've been emphasizing lately is the whole question of infrastructure, and it really, we really came to it through some seminars that we had where we tried to explore the evolution of technology. How, how does one technology get to be adopted and another technology doesn't? Is it always the best technology? Is it always the most cost-effective technology? There's been a lot of work on this lately, and to the contrary of the best technology always being adopted, and the classic example of this being the so-called QWERTY keyboard, Q-U-E-R-T-Y, are the basic keys of the standard typewriter on the upper left-hand side. And, and there's a lot of evidence that that configuration was adopted in the late um, 1800s in order to slow typists down because the primitive typewriters would jam. And so there was a good reason to have the, uh, to slow down the typists. Of course, now we have uh, electrical uh, uh, keyboards which don't jam. And so the original reason for having that typewriter is no longer valid. But it's been so locked into the marketplace, it's gotten such a firm foothold that it's almost impossible to change. And there are other examples. There are examples in, for example, the energy business where light water nuclear reactors were apparently adopted because those were the kinds of nuclear reactors that uh, were working on uh, Admiral Rickover's submarines and uh, nuclear aircraft carriers. And, and the first commercial installations uh, were basically made by saying that by, by basically taking an existing, what appeared to be an existing technology and adapting it to, um, to a new application. It may not have been the best type of reactor from the point of view of safety. Now, we've already heard Jeff Landis discussing a lot about thin film um, solar power satellites as a possible route to inexpensive solar uh, power delivered to the Earth. And, and we've been sort of exploring that. Seth has talked a little bit about it, uh, some of our studies, in terms of size of, um, of solar power satellites. We, we believe that a, a solar power satellite with a diameter of the order of 100 or perhaps 200 meters in low Earth orbit, that is in an orbit that would be hundreds of kilometers above the surface of the Earth, uh, could transmit to a comparably sized retina uh, at the surface of the Earth of the order of megawatts of power. Uh, and if you had enough of these satellites, uh, you could conceivably supply power continuously around the world. And when you hear about the fact that, my God, we're going to need hundreds of such satellites, it sounds like it's not very feasible, although that number of satellites does not seem unfeasible at all to the proponents of communication satellites who are planning to deploy hundreds of communication satellites in precisely the same orbits using very similar frequencies. Um, essentially, what our idea is, is to develop a solar power beaming satellite in which the power beam would be modulated to carry information, uh, just as communication satellites now transmit information to the surface. Uh, some fraction of the power beam could be modulated either in phase or amplitude or frequency uh, and carry information. And the pilot beam, which normally would go back to the satellite to steer the beam onto the rectenna, could provide the, uh, the uplink. In other words, both uplink and downlink communication satellites could be developed that would simultaneously provide power or communication. Now, more, I'm, I'm probably, how much time do I have? Okay, so let me just um, try, put, put some important things on. This is basically a screen dump I just took off of the internet of an experiment that was done on the Space Shuttle Endeavor uh, last Monday, less than a week ago, the Spartan 
uh, experiment was deployed in which a, 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 an inflatable antenna was deployed in, in space from the space shuttle. I mean, basically the Spartan was released and uh, actually, if you log on to the internet when you get home, uh, there's also a CNN site that has news about this. You just go to the NASA shuttle homepage and look for under payload for Spartan spacecraft. You can download some pretty fascinating quick time movies if you have um, that kind of computer, uh, which will basically shows you the deployment dynamics and shows you the results of in many ways, a successful experiment that, that uh, deployed uh, an inflatable antenna uh, with a diameter of 15 meters, that is about 15, 50 feet approximately. Um, and this is something that was just done this week. Uh, in many ways, it is the first step in establishing the technology of inflatable structures, establishing the, the, the viability of inflatable structures uh, that could be used perhaps as test vehicles in conjunction with the deployment of communication satellites to establish the viability of combined communication satellites and solar power satellites. Now we know that communication satellites already uh, focus beams, although they have relatively small antennas, so the beams that they transmit to the Earth at the surface of the Earth typically have large diameters of hundreds of kilometers. Um, and this is just a consequence of what Seth had been discussing earlier in the diffraction experiments. Uh, however, larger satellites with larger apertures could be more focused. Now, we do know that there is to be this explosion of communication satellites if all the funding comes into place, and there is a kind of feeding frenzy on Wall Street now to determine whether it's going to be possible to pay for all of these various systems. This is from an article in Aerospace America that appeared recently, and it includes the tele, you can see the uh, proposed LEO systems uh, shown on a plot of altitude versus orbital inclination, and you see there are quite a few in the altitude range from hundreds to thousands of kilometers, including the teledesic system, uh, the Motorola Iridium system, which is, represents an investment of $3.4 billion, 66 satellites. The idea is to provide per minute costs of two to three dollars. Uh, the Globe Star is particularly interesting to us. That's a 48 satellite system that includes plans to have village phone booths now, and these would be in remote areas of the Earth, and our idea would be to take, have the initial tests of an SPS communication system have the power for the telephone call to be transmitted along with the communications link. In other words, when you pick up your wire telephone at home, not a, not a cordless, but a wire, your current is in the, in the telephone, so even if you have a power failure, you can still make your telephone call. We might be able to create an initial feasibility test that would demonstrate that we could have remote phone calls from villages which don't have any power, where they get both the communications and the power. That would be a relatively modest amount of power that would establish the feasibility of the, this kind of system. And the beauty of it is that it can be grown gradually and that it produces a revenue stream as the system is growing. And we think that to appeal to entrepreneurs and to actually have a system that will, will really happen, uh, there, there has to be something in it for venture capitalists who are going to be putting up the money. I mean, it's, it's hard enough to try to generate an interest within NASA or the Department of Energy that this is a viable form of energy and that we're not going to run the 21st century with the same energy systems that we ran the 20th century. But uh, we do need to have this appeal, I believe, to, um, to investors, and I think that the system that we're proposing has that potential. Now, I know um, there's a hook getting ready to pull me off, but let me just quickly say one way to test this might be uh, to try to include, uh, if anyone were ever to build in, uh, uh, the SPS 2000-like system, um, which the Japanese 
been working on, it might be possible to do feasibility tests on that system that would involve um, integrated communication and power beaming as well. So let me just now conclude, I haven't been able to show everything, but the basic point I'd like to leave you with is that there are two fundamental issues that are relating to solar power satellites that I think have to be stressed, and both of them have to be stressed. The first is that there is a distinct possibility that the 21st century will be characterized by acute global environmental problems driven ultimately by population, but working themselves out in the political arena, and that the United States, as well as many other countries, were already committed by treaty to develop implementation plans to reduce their carbon emissions. And that specifically, if one works out the implications of those treaties, that treaty in particular, uh, there will be a requirement to have very large amounts of carbon-free energy. We don't have systems that can produce that yet. The second point, I'm almost done. The second point, really, is that the, the satisfaction of these goals cannot be simply legislated by governments. There has to be a, a path, an entrepreneurial path, where people can make money and out of greed wind up doing something that's advantageous to the planet in the way that Adam Smith foresaw with his invisible hand. And I think that what, we're, what we've been doing really is to try to develop strategies that have those two prompts. Okay, now I'm done. Well, I must say this, in, in all of the work that I've done with the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, simply getting SPS to be recognized as an energy alternative uh, has been very difficult. SPS is not, there is a lack of awareness that, that, that this technology exists and has the potential for addressing the problems. In fact, the IPCC reports and the World Bank reports or are all predicated on the energy technology of the next century being the same as the energy technology of this century, but more cost effective. That's, that's another topic, but right? I mean, it's, it's, it's totally ridiculous, but uh, that's how they do it. Thank you, Marty. Uh, John Strickland, uh, who's originally from New York City and now uh, lives in Austin, Texas, uh, is a member of the AIAA, and he was active in L5 and NSI, predecessor organizations to NSS. He's currently uh, chairman of the Austin Space Frontier Society. Um, and uh, on a personal note, um, John's work in comparing uh, space and terrestrial solar power has independently confirmed some of the same numbers uh, that Marty Hoffert and I got using a totally different way of arriving at those figures. So I always like to invite John because it's very flattering when somebody vindicates you. Anyway, <laughs> environmentalist influenced by one of the major uh, national environmental groups, 
they said we won't agree with us at all. And they say that you know, all we really need is renewable energy sources and ground solar power, and they can point to enough, quite a few different publications which give numbers which seem very uh, scientific and all, that say we don't need solar power satellites at all. And in fact, they're bad because they're large and would only be owned by big corporations, which are bad, and all these other philosophical or reasons why, why it's not a good idea. And we're going to get a point across. We each have to be able to discuss and try, gradually try to correct and modify some of these opinions held by other groups in the, in the news media, because the news media overwhelmingly get and project to the public their impressions of all this from some of these, what I call the more radical and anti-human uh, ideological points of view. So let's start off looking here. Here we have the uh, United States, this is back in 1987, from some of, again, from some of these uh, scientific American uh, issues of, of a few years ago. Looking at our energy, produ uh, energy um, production, and as you can see, virtually all of our production is coming from carbon. All others is basically about 11 to 12 percent. May, may have risen to 12 percent right now. And again, looking at the carbon dioxide production, if you can see, say for example, China and other developing countries are the orange and the red. In the back, the 1950s on the left, is a rather small slice of the pie. But that's going to rise dramatically. And this in fact was going up to 1985 as a prediction. And of course now it's 1995. And the United States is sheer is now under 25% of the total of the carbon dioxide production, where it used to be almost half in 1950. See, that's not the art of share shrinking, but the, uh, the share of other countries, particularly China, which would be forced to go to coal unless an alternative is provided to, to them, uh, is uh, <coughs> increasing very rapidly. The other thing we do have to consider, however, is our current models really don't tell us yet whether it's an imperative to reduce the carbon dioxide production, even though we know that probably there will be a global greenhouse effect from it. But in effect, we are actually still in the place to see. And when our current interglacial ends, as it ultimately will, do we in fact want to boost the production of carbon dioxide or at least be ready to boost it? to counter the next glacial period, which we suspect because of the carbon dioxide levels, uh, in this case, the, the temperatures are red, and the carbon dioxide and the levels are shown in the black, of silicon gas so closely follow the global temperatures, and we think that we can also drive the global temperatures by the global carbon dioxide level. So this would in, 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 uh, tend to protect us against the more extreme effects of, a, of an ice age which tend to last 50 to 100,000 years. It's very undesirable to have most of the northern hemisphere covered by two miles of ice for our civilization. So this is one thing we have to keep in mind at the same time we're addressing the more immediate problems of overpopulation driven of global warming. Okay, take a look at, then of course the media will say, well, we, all we really need is al alternate energy. Take a look at the other major forms of alternate energy. We've got, for example, geothermal. Almost all of these forms are, are primarily limited by the number of, of the sites that are very limited. But there's also other problems with them. For example, uh, pollution from the geothermal wells. Hydroelectric uh, causes flooding of habitats and massive construction. Wind power kills raptors, uh, causes safe sound pollution, covers large areas of ground. Uh, all very intermittent and very hard to predict when it will be available. Uh, biomass, of course, it produces carbon dioxide, which we're really not that excited about producing now. It produces heat, smog, and signatures on the ground. Uh, ocean thermal requires massive construction. Tidal power, even more limited. And it disrupts uh, estuaries and ocean life and, and, and 
requires massive construction. So, and, but when you add all these things up, they're only producing maybe, if, if you're very optimistic, a couple hundred gigawatts. We need much more than that to provide the globe, the global civilization, with energy to offset the requirement for getting rid of a lot of the carbon-based fuel. <coughs> so, of course, the next thing, well, the, the, the media will say, well, even if we discount all the other alternative energies, we always have the sun, and all we really need is ground solar power. Of course, they just refer to it as solar power. They don't consider space solar power at all. But I refer to it as ground solar power. Of course, the, the sun is a, a good for at least another four to five billion years of energy. But there are three major problems with ground solar power. It's a very weak, confused <coughs> source of energy compared to some of our current energy uh, production methods. It needs lots of land and materials to collect the energy, <coughs> and labor to build and maintain the plant. It's not available most of the time, during the night, obviously, which can last most of the time during some um, areas during the uh, winter time. In cloudy weather, in Austin, you can go for a week at a time or more with no sun at all. And per during periods of low sun angle. Thus, most power must be stored before it's used, which is very expensive and, and requires lots of mass and money to fill. It's also very site dependent. In the U.S., only the Southwest has really good sites. And most of many of our cities are, are in poor locations for solar energy. Major cost effective income uses for ground solar power using photovoltaic panels. Uh, this is looking at the uh, current situation. Uh, the best uh, purpose right now is flying areas that don't have grid power. It's a very obvious. No matter how much it costs, if you don't have a grid, and you need power, you have to bring it in for the itself, and then you've got to produce a nitrate back of it for other than intermittent use, like for pump power. In the near future, uh, decentralized applications, you can run the air, type, uh, air conditioning, in other words, when the sun is out, it gets hot, and that's when you can use your air conditioning, that's when the power is available to run, like on your rooftop. Power to charge up your electric vehicles, and space water heating on multi-mode panels where the same panel can provide the power and heat to your individual home. Future, uh, which is becoming almost marginally possible to do now, will be centralized peak daytime power production. Again, optimal sites only, based on the economics of, of power production, not push the thing. Such an exceptional site as this, be your less plant, which is actually a thermodynamic plant, a concentrated, not photovoltaic. But it does have the current advantage, unfortunately, no longer being produced at the moment, uh, of being able to use gas fired power during the night instead of storing the power. So you're actually uh, getting around the problem of storage with this kind of a system. Okay, looking at our way of looking at it here, we've got the blue area represents your base load, that is the minimum <coughs> power that you need to run a city uh, all the time. The red, consider that the peak load on top of that. Uh, this is actually Austin for August uh, 1989, a single day, showing on that very, very the day. And uh, this is about 1,400 peak load. 800, about 800 space load. That probably is about uh, one gigawatt now, and probably about 1,600 uh, megawatts now, now for the peak load. Now, if you look at solar power during the uh, summertime, we get a pretty even coverage of the country, except for some parts of Appalachia and the Olympic Peninsula in Florida. So you look, take a look at the same picture during the winter time and see what happens. It shrinks back to the extreme southwest United States, 
many of the areas in the northeast and the northwest get maybe a couple hours of sunlight a day average. Austin, uh, during the winter, which looks like it's pretty good, gets an average of four hours. If you, if you do a theoretical calculation, the actual measurements, it shows it's more like three hours a day average. So it's not very much in electricity. It's not very much sunlight. You get out. Okay, now, this is what we're getting during a given uh, year, looking at January to December. And if you look at January and December, these are the actual measurements in Austin for the number of equivalent hours of full sun each day. Getting about four in January to about three in December, which again isn't very much. We're getting about eight in the middle of the summer. And the average is about six. So that means about only about 25% of the time average during the year are you getting power. And you're getting less than that, you're getting about one sixth to one eighth uh, of the time during the winter. And because the winter is a critical period, in other words, you can't uh, just say the average, you have to take the worst case. So we're going to take that and call it about four hours a day, so it's really up to eight for. Now this takes a look at baseload plant, say an existing uh, coal and nuclear plant, which is the bag. It's going to have to produce a total of 24 gigawatt hours a day to support a city that requires one, uh, a gig one gigawatt of uh, power load. <coughs> that represents the red. The uh, green represents the summer day, the blue represents the winter day, and the very light blue represents Cloudy day. So on a cloudy day, anytime, you don't get much power at all. During the uh, winter time, you're basically picking up power from about 8 o'clock in the morning to about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And of course, it drops off pretty rapidly. And you're really only getting peak power during from about 10 o'clock to maybe about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So as you can see how restricted the period of power is that you're getting and how large the period is you're not getting any power at all. Because that means you have to store the energy that you're going to be getting uh, during those very few hours when you're getting power. This is an example of a small 250 uh, kilowatt plant called the Decker plant in Austin, Texas. Uh, it's all basically uh, fixed panels tilted to the south. Taking a look at one of these plants, Single axis panels, I think it's about 9-10% efficiency. Uh, those are the extra numbers. Uh, for 1990, we had about 4.6 hours a day during the winter and about 4.6 hours a day during the summer. So I'm being a little optimistic on a model plan, which is the right column, and sort of averaging all this out and saying getting exactly 10% efficiency. Uh, having four hours a day during the winter, six hours a day during the summer, and calling it 25 minutes per meters. The site size is four times larger, it's 10,000 square meters. The total plant mass is 100 metric tons. The total cost of the model plant is half of the awesome plant cost, about $1 million. And the quality and price of it, about $6,500. Uh, installed uh, cost per kilowatt hour. Now that's actually a reasonable cost now for a peak load plant, but not for a base load plant. Okay, a city we have to provide 24 gigawatt hours uh, to a city using some different power systems. Looking at it from the space point of view, you have 24 hours a day, and you have a collective capacity of 1 gigawatt. You re you're generating 24 gigawatt hours, and power available is 24 gigawatt hours, and you're okay there. Going down to the peak load plant, uh, 40,000 times larger than the model plant we just looked at for Austin. You're going for six hours, you're getting your collective capacity to get one gigawatt. Power generation is 60 gigawatt hours, so you have one quarter of what you need for one day. Assuming you have 100% recovery of your energy from the storage system, you could go to that. And you have a collective capacity of 4 gigawatts. It's four times larger 
than what the city actually requires to get on an instantaneous basis. You generate your 24 gigawatt hours. You get their 24 gigawatt hours. The same would be true if you go for your winter period of time. So you need a, a flight capacity of 6 gigawatt hours. And <coughs> but again, that's impossible because you can never get back 100% of what you store. So let's assume that you're going to get 40% recovery of the energy you store. So you have uh, four, four hours of sunlight, and you get 24 gigawatt hours, but you're only getting 9.6 gigawatt hours back. So you're still only getting about a little over a third of the energy that you need. So what you really have to do is you, your collector has to be 13.5 gigawatts in capacity. He has to produce 52 gigawatt hours to get back out of your storage at the end of that 24 gigawatt hour. So here's the actual calculation in blue. This is a, a one gigawatt for one day output to storage for immediate use. Uh, in blue, the required output to storage is 20 gigawatt hours. You're using four gigawatt hours immediately during your four gigawatt hours. Uh, divided by your number factor, your required input for 50 gigawatt hours, daytime energy use is 4, the total needed per day is 54. You divide that by the hours of full sun, you get 13.5 gigawatts of capacity. So that adds up correctly. So you can see why a ground-based solar collector has to be much larger than what you actually think it has to be to provide your base load power Yes, remember that's only the collector system, not including the cost of the storage system, which could all be equally expensive. So here's taking a look at the pie. The red are your storage losses. The light blue is your daytime use, and the dark blue is the nighttime use. And that, that adds up the total production required by your solar collector. You can look at this a number of other ways. If you vary the hours that you put on full sun, as it gets shorter and shorter, uh, the 10 hours is the extreme left and two hours is the extreme right. With a fixed recovery rate, your, the size of your collector goes up very rapidly towards the right. And if you have two hours of sun, you require a 28.5 uh, gigawatt capacity collector for your one gigawatt. One gigawatt a city. On the other hand, if you vary your recovery ratio, it holds your uh, equivalent hours of full sun fixed at four hours a day. Uh, if your uh, ratio drops from an impossible 100% at the extreme left to 30% at the extreme right, your collector goes up from 6 gigawatt to 17 gigawatt. You put this all together, and you can see, here's an example, 37 gigawatt required for, I think, is that two hours? If it's two hours a day, the 30% recovery. And again, 100% is just theoretical for, for display only. It's impossible. So how, what, how, how much would one of these things weigh and how much would it cost? Well, if you have a uh, collective, it's 13 13.5 gigawatts at 13,500 megawatts. Dividing that by the amount of capacity uh, of uh, 0.25 megawatts yields a scaling factor of 54,000. So based on your the area of your mile site times your scaling factor gives you a land area of 135 kilometers squared. Where that just supports uh, one city, uh, Austin, Texas, and one gigawatt that is roughly a public area. Uh, the massive amount of collector, uh, 100 metric tons, can do scaling factor 55,000, gives you a mass of 5 million metric tons for that collector. And you can see this is very expensive. Then I got a thing here showing you mass area. And all these things are also on in the article. Okay. 
the, some of the advantages of our satellite, obviously, are that it's available almost all the time. The biggest advantage is you don't have to store the energy. The availability of switching to additional power satellites which would be available to cover the satellites which are passing through, through the Earth's uh, umbra. Uh, um, you get rid of the need for storing any energy. Take a look again to reference design, high big watts, which you've all gone over before, continuous power except for brief eclipses, uh, the weight, the total weight of the collective system, only 50,000 extra tons, it's actually now reduced to probably only about 5,000 in the equivalent area. Uh, 5 by 10 kilometers for the advances in, in uh, photovoltaic cells, you probably be reduced to about 5 by 5 kilometers. Uh, Basically, it's just a, uh, a very, very great improvement over, uh, over your ground-based system. And some use of the record system. You don't have to do any tracking. In your ground-based system, you don't have to track the sun to get maximum power out of it. Uh, in space, you have to do 30 to 40% advantage uh, in terms of actual power coming in, because the atmosphere isn't in the way. You see nothing about clouds in the Earth. You get the track, you don't have to track the sun with your, your satellite, you can aim at the sun all the time. The only thing you have to track is the, uh, uh, the transmitting antenna down to the ground. Which of course is only once every 24 hours, so it's very, very slow movement and there's not much friction involved. And of course your antenna is much, much lighter than, than a equivalent solar panel. You don't have the problem of having optical surfaces, which the wind will tend to catch. Uh, and which, so your structure to support those surfaces must be much more massive, where the equivalent direct end element is basically just a bunch of wires that is relatively not damaged by wind, hail, and a whole host of other things like just plain old dirt, which you would otherwise have to clean up your optical surfaces. And of course, as people also mentioned, you can have dual use of your site. You can have uh, greenhouses or graze cattle or graze crops that you put in your antenna. Because after all, 80% of your sunlight is still not going to get through their antenna grid in the ground. And another thing is that compared to ground solar power with a ground uh, solar uh, panel, 80% say of your sunlight is being converted directly into heat with your uh, power uh, so on a satellite or antenna, only a few percent of the energy received from the ground is being converted to heat. So the argument about that our satellites are going to upset the Earth's heat balance is actually completely reversed. And the, uh, solar parts, the ground solar tower stations are the ones that would upset the, not only the global heat balance, but the local weather if you have enough of them. Imagine thousands of square miles covered with black uh, film and think of what that would do to the weather. Now, if you take a look at total energy incident in one square meter of an SPS antenna, you can see how much energy you get out of them. If you paint the rectangular elements white, you can actually reverse the heat balance on this. So there's a great, great, great advantage in using the rectangular. But the whole thing acts as sort of a giant energy filter. In effect, you're filtering out the heat elements 23,000 miles up space and getting down to the ground only the pure electrical energy that you're using and wasting only a few percent of that on the ground. So it's like, like a giant entropy filter, you might say. Now this is another way of looking at the difference between ground solar power and space solar power. You start off with your one, uh, say one uh, kilowatt of uh, power collected by one square meter on the ground. So you get 10% efficiency, so you get 100 watts out of the air. And you then uh, have six hours of that available, so you get, uh, for one day, 600 watts total of energy. And on the other hand, your, your power satellite is coming down, you're capturing, I think, 75, uh, watts in the same square meter, but once you 
you have 75% recovery efficiency greater, you're getting you're hitting something like 68 watts of that in that meter. But because it's available 24 hours, you're going to be getting 1,600 watts of power. So that's 1,600 watts per square meter of collector compared to 600 watts for your solar, ground solar photovoltaic collector. So it's more efficient in terms of land use also. Also, the, the same waste heat that I've come up with here shows that you get much, much more waste heat out of, say, a coal uh, or a nuclear plant, which is the metal, and a ground solar collector, which is on the right, compared to your, your right channel system, which is on the left, you're building in like 7% of waste heat. Uh, so out of 1,000 uh, watts, you're getting 70 watts wasted. Now that's about the same amount of waste heat as in the subdivision. So it's not very high. And again, compared to the areas of these things, so if you can bar on the left is the area of the Austin, Texas road. For your base load uh, ground based system, you have a uh, in the land area larger than the whole city of Austin. <coughs> this is totally ludicrous because of the extreme restrictions of land use around ground Austin. So all the popular authors who claim that there's enough land just on the roofs of buildings to support the use of ground-based solar power are completely out of the ballpark with their numbers. Because even if you include the entire area of the city, it's still enough, not, not enough room. And even anywhere nearby, there's no place to use such a large area. So it's like not even counting the cost of the land, or the expense of building it, or the expense of the, of the energy storage system that would be required. Compare that to the very tiny area for your antenna system. And again, your mass, it goes with the same argument there, the mass of the cars <coughs> of the antenna, the, the one that says 0.02 is a share of a 5 gigawatt antenna, uh, which is one fifth of it, which is uh, quite small. And you can see how much mass would be required. I'm now looking at your energy demand ratio. Uh, the world demand is now probably to about 12 to 10. This is some time ago. U.S. demand, compared to that, is about one quarter. It's shrinking down probably about 30% now. U.S. generation is probably about 700 uh, gigawatts. And the U.S. electric power uh, out of that is about 350 gigawatts. So, U.S. energy use of the lower quadrant, uh, the lower right quadrant, is generating losses. So we've got transportation and fuel about half of it, and home use is about a quarter of it. So if you take a look at a national scale system, <coughs> we're going to do this in national scale on the ground, the numbers just become truly astronomical to try to do it on the ground. I won't go through the numbers, but I'll jump over to some graph here. Uh, this shows the area, the state of Arizona. And the ground, uh, I think Mr. Zweibel, in a popular book, said he could do it with 13,000 square miles for a national system. Well, the Arizona is about 300,000 square miles, actually square kilometers. We uh, require at least 180,000 square kilometers for a national grid system. And this, this is the very best area. And if you're going to use, uh, say, hydroelectric pump generating storage, on the left is the area of Lake Erie. And on the right is the area, assuming I think you have 20 meter depth of, of your of reservoir, you have the two reservoirs, one 300 meters above the other, which and the total volume of water in the, in the one lake has to be pushed up, pumped up 300 meters to the other lake and then let down during the night to provide the energy. That's the scale of storage we're talking about for a national electrical system. If you, any of you have flown over Lake Erie, you know, you know how long it takes to drive from one end of it to the other. That gives you a little bit of an idea. Well, there's a whole series of advantages. These are all available. Uh, more detailed coverage are in my article. Now, that's the main stuff I wanted to cover. What is the, uh, what is this difference between the two systems? We do, however, have to wait for one additional piece of equipment before we can make our system work, which is, of course, 
two next is the space, and the answer, of course, is sitting out and being tested right now in white sands. And I think with that, I'll close. I, mean, I do have on the table, on the table copies of my article uh, that was published a few months ago and a single sheet which has in, uh, a, a one-page condensation. How much uh, would you, uh, you, you estimated to get five gigawatts, you need a five kilometer by five kilometer uh, solar satellite. Right. Uh, well, how much do you estimate something like that would weigh? I've actually it's in my paper, I have to look it up. It's, it's like one tenth is the ground, equal to the ground, I don't know where you want to go. Or less. You're comparing ground collection to ground receivers, right? But I have to look at this in the paper. Yeah, I'm just trying to get a sense of how many space missions with the, uh, say, the, the uh, new RLB you'd be looking at to put one of them up. In the long run, I support the use of wood resources to build this stuff, which is the energy to greatly reduce the first requirements. And then
that would correspond to a cash flow right in this period of about 15 to 16 thousand billion dollars a year, uh, a little over 16, 17 trillion dollars a year. The world gross product right now is about between 20 and 25 trillion dollars a year. The U.S. is right about here. That would also correspond to uh, 850 trillion dollars total sales over that period. Now, there's something that is just simply not appreciated in the public debates over world energy needs. And that is that if you see a graph or an argument that says, hey, we've got plenty of coal, we've got plenty of oil for several more centuries, and you see that repeatedly in US government, Department of Energy, World Energy Council reports, and so on and so forth, what they're basically saying is most of the world, most of the people in the world are going to stay dirt poor as far as energy use is concerned. Right now, the world electric output is about 1,200 gigawatts electric. The world thermal is about 10,000 gigawatts thermal. Electrically, that corresponds average over the whole world, about 250 watts. But the billion people in the developed countries use most of that energy. Most people, about half the pop that population of Earth have absolutely no access to electricity, and virtually none to commercial thermal energy. So we're talking a very major challenge here. It's uh, very hard to do this provision of electricity with conventional systems for several reasons. One of them is that generally when you convert thermal energy, coal, oil, whatever, to electricity, you convert about 30% of it into the output electricity. So what you'd have to put into this is not 1 million gigawatt years of electric, but 3 million gigawatt years of thermal energy. The problem is, recoverable, the economically accessible uh, stores of coal, coal shale, uh, heavy oils, are only about 2 million gigawatt years. And so any power system you talk about, you're talking about putting in a conventional system, you're talking about putting enormous amounts of capital, and we'll get to that in a minute, and it builds up to fruition just about the time you run out of the inputs, in addition to totally screwing up the environment through CO2. Acid oil. Now, how much does it cost to do things over this life cycle? You know, I'm not talking here about a technology demo. I'm talking about what it takes to power, achieve power in a prosperous world. Okay, what we have here is cost in trillions of dollars. So this runs from zero to three hundred trillion dollars over a seventy-year period to output one million gigawatt electric years of energy. And we look at this for the three in conventional <coughs> systems. For coal, and this is one slice of data out of a, out of a multi-dimensional analysis of this problem that I did with uh, an economist at the University of Houston, Russell Thompson. And when you go through all possible combinations in this prototype analysis using real DOE uh, contractor data, not stuff that we generate, you find that the lunar approach is going to be at least 16 times better than any possible combination of the conventional approaches. But in this particular case, we see that if you try to use conventional or actually advanced coal systems to supply this energy, this 1 million gigawatt years of thermal electric energy, it would cost you on the order of 12,000, uh, 1,200 trillion dollars. Sorry, I got mixed up. This Ferguson said a trillion here, a trillion here. That adds up to real money. <laughs> uh, and notice about a third of that is capital, the white area. Most of it, though, is related to handling waste. The fuel is not that major a component of cost. Vision, capital is about the same as advanced code. This is advanced vision, not green. Uh, you're dominated by the handling of waste, the loss of life associated with mine accident. Mining is primarily the thing in this particular example, but all you have to do is throw in a few more Chernobyls, and this number gets very conservative. A point that John Strickland just made is, and again, if you go with uh, uh, solar photovoltaic and solar, I'm sorry, solar thermal and solar photovoltaic on Earth, and these would be in ideal locations out in California and Arizona, the life cycle cost, and it's going to be mostly capital, 
is actually going to be on the order or higher than the life cycle cost of the, uh, the coal system. Now, there's another point to be made here. We're talking about trying to provide a prosperous world. Well, the problem in this country, and it's a problem worldwide, is that per capita world income has not gone up for something on the order of 10 or 20 years. It's on the order of $4,000 per person a year when you average over the entire world. If you cannot figure out a better way to get cheaper power back to Earth, you're probably not going to change that ratio substantially. Now, again, assuming the population grows from 5.3 to 10 million people between now and 2050, and then maintain the 10 million in another 20 years, if you add up the gross product of every one of those people over that entire time, it's only $3,000 trillion. So the way the world is going right now, you'd have to spend most of your money on just the power system. That brings us down to the lunar reference system. I've got three examples here, which are reported in the literature, but I'll just give you a survey at this particular point. The lunar solar power reference system. Incidentally, uh, the Journal of Solar Energy, the January issue, uh, Blazer edited, and uh, Thompson and I have a paper in that dealing with these economics. It's, around page 130, something is sort of the middle of the journal. Uh, say it, it's the Journal of Solar Energy, uh, Pergamon Press, and it's a special issue, January 96, special issue with Blazer, and uh, Strickland's articles in it, and I think John Hoffman has an article about it also. The solar, lunar solar power system, the sunlight, is your dependable existing fusion reactor is the source of energy. You use an existing uh, satellite, the moon, on which to capture that sunlight. You collect, capture it in bases, pairs of bases, one of, uh, on the east and the west limb of the moon, so one or the other is always exposed, except for about three hours during an eclipse of the moon by the Earth. On the bases, power, the solar power is converted to electricity, electricity to microwaves, and then the microwaves are projected out of any one base. Thousands of beams are projected either directly back to Earth or to provide load following power to microwave relay, uh, either mirrors or redirector satellites. The mechanically simplest would be a mirror, one beam in, one beam to Earth. That's probably the most expensive and the hardest to do because it requires high mechanical accuracy. What I think is far more likely is you'd be eliminating microwave receiving satellites, and then they would uh, divide the power into multiple beams going down to Earth. And I think 10, 20 beam division is reasonable. So as a first cut, you can think that you'd have about as many, uh, you'd have about uh, 10 receivers on Earth for every satellite, active relay satellite up here. Now there's a subtlety here. These would be very large shared transmitting apertures on the moon, and they would let this system operate with focused beams, as <coughs> these would be oversized to let you have focused beams. So rather than being what uh, was described uh, uh, earlier by Seth as a, as a divergence beam system, this would be a focusing beam system. That's not exotic. Uh, most people here wear eyeglasses like I do. That's a focusing system. This view graph is a focusing system. This approach toward providing power has enormous economies. And the reason is you don't use rockets to send pieces up into space. You use rockets to send your means of production, little factories into space. And you get about 500 times, with 1980s technology, you get about 500 times the productivity of replacing power as you got for the reference system. As you go to more modern technology, such as we've been talking about here, most of those you can um, in the lunar case and preserve that uh, enormous increase in productivity. Okay, it's a foggy day, so here's the sun. You can just barely see it over there. Here's the moon, here's one base, and we're just showing one beam coming directly down to this rectangle. What I'll talk to you about cost estimates, I assume that the 
intensity of this beam is about 20% sunlight, so about 250 watts per square meter. Average output of the rectenna is about uh, 180 watts, 200 watts per square meter, average over a day or average over a year. Uh, this would be an industrially zoned area. It could be located over factories, it could be located over farmland. With the extra large size uh, uh, antennas on the moon, you can uniformly illuminate uh, the rectenna, even to rectennas as small as half a kilometer across. Once you step outside of that area, though, you can have the intensity out here fall down by a factor of 10 to the third easily, very far down below uh, what's allowed for continuous exposure to the general population. <clears throat> In fact, this system, I think, can be so cheap that you could even operate this rectenna at the densities of microwave allowed for continuous exposure to the general population and still be competitive with conventional sources. A rectenna, though, that is putting out about 180 watts per square meter uh, of power, that's equivalent, per, if you had a square kilometer of, of area here, that's equivalent to having an oil well that puts out 3.3 million barrels a year of oil, or 660,000 ton, tons a year of coal. And as several other speakers have pointed out, there would be no pollution out of this, uh, no depletion of terrestrial resources. It's very easy to make this energy neutral. Uh, you bring in high quality microwave, you reflect out low quality sunlight by just putting a white grid or black box under your rectangle. And what you're getting out of here is net new energy, which we do not achieve by any of, any of the conventional systems. Now when I talk about costs, these are not arbitrarily pulled out of the air. DOE and NASA, uh, and especially NASA, put in about $10 million in engineering cost studies of the reference system. Another $3 million, $2 to $3 million, went into building the reference system out of lunar materials. It was constructed a base on the moon, took materials out into space, converted them into, into, material, into components. I was, that was, most of that was done by General Dynamics Corporation in San Diego in the late 70s, augmented by data from MIT about a three-year study under Lynn Miller and my studies at the Lunar Planetary Institute. I was the only person funded in the 70s on how you take lunar by NASA, how you take lunar materials and convert it into engineering materials. So I took those studies and used that to scale the cost of operations on space and orbit around the moon and orbit around the Earth, factories on the Earth, uh, supply ships from Earth to moon. All of that is included all the costs that I'm talking about. And I can study the, the sensitivity of the final cost to, to virtually all the key elements. When you get up to a large scale of emplacement though, the energy cost is essentially proportional to the cost of the rectenna divided by the beam intensity per square foot times some financial cost recovery factor plus rectenna maintenance. In other words, it's the stuff on the earth that derives the cost. Why is that? Well, people have held up these thin films in front of you several times. That's what you're doing on the moon. You're creating thin films. When you get that techno production technology in place, you're going to cover enormous areas very quickly at low unit cost. It's building the rectennas on Earth that are the expensive part. With 80s technology, what was proposed for the SBS reference system, you then get cost on the order of seven tenths of a cent kilowatt hour with the lunar approach. This is about a factor of 100 less than talked about for the reference case where you threw everything up from, to space from Earth. Newer technologies will radically decrease the upfront cost of the project and the cost of the energy. I can, I can foresee, uh, without blushing too much, that you can get energy costs down to about a tenth of a cent kilowatt hour electric. Uh, considerably below Long Island cost. This has very interesting implications for a terrestrial industry in the future. Rectennas, uh, the big change between the late 70s, the idea of a rectenna is a standalone collection of, of aluminum TV UHF antennas, and today is today you can build the rectennas, in fact, for quite for a decade, this printed circuitry. There's no reason that they can't be integrated. <coughs> at almost no additional cost into the roofing 
of, of industrially zoned buildings, put, over, put its light screen, sunscreens over parking lots, uh, uh, boundary property, agricultural land. If you're selling that power out of a system like that at three cents a kilowatt hour, the, avoidance, the average avoidance rate for the U.S. Uh, electric industry today, that produces on the order of four dollars a square foot a year of net profit. That corresponds to the average value of commercial real estate, not just a shop or not just a factory, but including all the land area it occupies, of about a dollar a square foot a year. So this is an opportunity to essentially totally restructure the intrinsic value of commercial real estate and industrial real estate. What do you do on the moon? Well, this is a sketch that's been shown many times. Uh, there's a, an article, uh, the IEEE Potential, it's a student magazine for IEEE, their <coughs> May issue this year, has an intro article on this. And, and this has been published in many different places. But inside of one of the uh, circles on the moon that I, that I showed you earlier, never tried to chase down a loose view graph. Uh, inside of one of those circles on the limb of the moon, you would construct a, a power station. The power station would be composed of power plots. Power plots are not megalithic structures. They may be something the size of this room, comparable to, to uh, stuff that we've already put into space. Inside of one of those plot, uh, power uh, stations, though, on the moon the moon, the Earth would always stay just about that position in the sky. It would move around about five degrees off the north side over an 11-year period. What that means is most of the equipment that you build for directing power toward the Earth can be stationary or it can be built so it moves very, very slowly, like clockwork. A power plot is composed of solar cells made directly out of the, uh, it's basically a glass-making operation. You may even bring your active thin film material to Earth. Uh, is made directly from the lunar soil. These would be, in this particular design, and there are infinite number of designs you look at, these uh, power converter solar cells would run in a, a north-south direction, the TP shape, so that, oh, of course, it would be the power level of solar output. You'd use lunar iron or lunar aluminum uh, as wiring under the lunar soil to collect the electric power and send it to microwave diodes, more than likely, not too different from in cellular phones now. Each would be individually phased. Each diode then would radiate toward a screen made of lunar soil. This could be foam glass or glass tubing made out of lunar material. And there's absolutely no doubt that you can do these things. And then lunar fiberglass coated with lunar metals to form an electric screen. This would be on the order of one centimeter grid so sunlight could go through. The microwaves would be reflected. Now one of these plots by itself, that's the, that's, the in, that's the unit, that's the cell, so to speak, of the system. It would be virtually no good. It would just interfere a little bit with radio astronomy. But you position thousands and thousands of these in an area on the order of 30 to 100 kilometers across as seen from the Earth. Phase each set of diodes in front of each of those to produce one beam going back toward the Earth. And we think that you can get at least hundreds, probably thousands of beams back uh, out of one of these back toward the Earth. There's no magic technology in this. There, you will not find a t-shirt like you find in Princeton which says fusion is the energy of the future and always will be. Uh, there are reasonable comfort tests to make absolutely sure you can do this. Uh, a set of four surveyor landers landed on the moon at the edges of one of these potential sites can be used to demonstrate phase control for several years back to the Earth. You can use upgrades and existing phased array radars formerly used for tracking ballistic missiles to send a commercial size beam to Earth orbit and then use a reflector satellite about 20 times bigger than what was flown out of the there last week, reflect that beam down to a commercial size rectangle. That way you can you can do these things with 
technology, and more important, people and their skills, we've got to write down. The operating components, uh, this thing makes sense even with 5% efficient cells. It gets much more efficient you go higher in efficiency. Uh, microwave tri uh, transmitters, well, we know about those. Reflectors, uh, that's, uh, there's no doubt that you can, you can build that out of any material. Distributed phased array, people tend to choke up on the idea of a transmitter 30 to 100 kilometers across. There are two things you have to do to send a, a microwave signal in the preferred direction. Adjust the phasing of each of the elements and adjust the amplitude of each of the elements. The phasing is the hard part. For over 15 years, the National uh, Radio Astronomy Observatory has been operating a, an array, a very large array, out in Socorro, New Mexico, at 100 times the phasing accuracy required to do the power. And that's, a, that's the thing you uh, uh, the triangular, uh, the big array of dishes that move over a Y shaped set of arms out in New Mexico. It's a much, much more difficult problem. The theory is extremely well understood. The orbital reflectors, and especially the orbital retransmitters, are probably the, high, the hardest technology challenge in this, but it's not something that's strange to us. A side-looking radar that operates on the shuttle operates at peak powers, which are only order what you take need for power transmission from the Earth, from space to the Earth. So a lot of these things that get attention as big technology hurdles, I think, are not. The production system on the moon, you have to demonstrate that, but again, these are lab prototype scale that can give you the confidence to move uh, up to demos that you operate on Earth in vacuum chambers like the ones at Johnson or up associated with Lewis. Once you get that in hand, then it becomes quite reasonable to send prototype systems to the moon for full demos. Now, of course, you're not going to do the whole system at once. You have to go through demo stages. <coughs> One that we've looked at is suppose you committed to building a 100, kilowatt, 100 gigawatt demo over a 10 year period. You get back to the moon and 10 years later you've got 100 gigawatts. Uh, that would deliver over its build-up period about 500 gigawatt years of energy to Earth, which would uh, more than pay for the startup if you were paying all the cost. You know, if it was just a standalone project that had to pay for itself. However, if you could link this with a large lunar base, uh, a U.S. or international lunar base, the part of this that is absolutely unique to the lunar power system demo and the creation of the build-up would only be about a billion a year over a 10-year R&D period plus a 10-year production period. That would then uh, be at the scale that a consortium could take on. After, and again, most of the expenses of this would actually be back on Earth building the antennas. Now the question is, how do you get that? Well, a lot of comments in here about venture capital. I don't think venture capital is going to do this or, or even satellites in space. The analogy that comes to me is you can get venture capital or you can get private capital to build a, a used car dealer or a new car dealer on the side of the interstate, but you'll never get them to build the interstate. That's a government project. So my thought is that we need to use the government to get back. <laughs> this is absolutely serious. There is no nation on earth that has a space program. We're all in exactly the same position as Portugal was when uh, Henry the Navigator started sending little ships down the coast of Africa and find out where the Horn of Africa was, the tip of Africa was. All of our management is sitting inside the Beltway and it worries Beltway problems. And what that does is let Congress avoid making a commitment by the United States to a space program. We'll have a space program when we at least reach the Azores and start sending spices or something else back. Let's go and scale them down NASA headquarters. Okay, they're going to be down to 500. That's about the right size to do an enormous lunar power project. Let's have Congress commit this country to a space program, put NASA headquarters on the moon, not astronauts, NASA headquarters. And then that is the interstate analogy. 
that is the government presence that gives us physical presence, transportation infrastructure, and legal presence. And then to put a little twist in this, any company that does a billion dollars a year or more of contracting with the federal government, any of those companies that want a major, that want a, a massive contract, the CEO and the chairman of the board have to go to the moon to negotiate the contract. When I gave this talk to the electric power people, I had about a half dozen of the guys said, boy, our CEO would love to do it. I wonder if we could find that in the aerospace companies. <laughs> so if you provided this US, our international infrastructure, the cost of doing what I'm talking about drops tremendously. You're not going to do it without the legal presence there. Uh, when you get it to that point, then, there could be consortia that do the, the commercial part of the build-up on the moon, and then it revolves into your regular contractor force here on Earth building your right tenants. Um, if you were doing the full cost of this to provide the world with 20,000 gigawatts of electric power by 2050, then your expenses are down in this direction. And this is, uh, this is $2,000 billion a year cash flow. The expenses associated with it, mostly uh, once, uh, in the first part, the R&D phase, it's, it's on the order of high-tech DOD purchases now. Once you get past that, it turns essentially into rectenna expenses, building and maintaining the rectennas, and this is the old-style rectennas. But the cash flow associated with this, the revenue, is, as I mentioned to you earlier. Now, there are details in this graph available published. Uh, the point of this is there's an enormous potential here for taking care of cross growth. Now you can have your space transportation in this only, high space transportation costs only increase the upfront cost and not have almost no effect on the cost of kilowatt hour of the electricity. Uh, so I've probably got the only project here in which uh, McDonnell Douglas is not successful at all. Right? So let me wind this up with a little bit of histrionics. The lunar solar power system uses known technology and it uses known lunar resources. And it can de provide dependable solar power, it uses dependable solar power in space to feed back to Earth. The power from the rectennas is safe, it's clean, it's economic and environmentally, not benign, environmentally beneficial. You can finally start husbanding the resources of Earth and bringing them back into a state of health. It only requires a fraction of the present expenditures on space and an infinitesimal fraction of the expenditures of the world on energy. Can greatly increase world and per capita income. There's an empirical relation between the amount of electricity used in the modern economy and its gross domestic product increase. And that is about a dollar of new product per kilowatt hour of electric energy. If you had a 20,000 gigawatt electric world, in 2050 you could be talking about a gross world product on the order of 150 to 200 trillion dollars a year. In other words, about eight times more than what we have now. And that's not, and, and that income will be a lot more net income because it will be less downside in environmental cost or the cost of capital to support the energy structure. Of absolutely fundamental importance, you've got to have power from space because it provides a fundamental diversity of our power systems. In other words, we start getting power that is independent of the biosphere. If we don't do that, we're in very bad shape. We're essentially in shape now with bacteria in a, petri, in a thin petri dish that are very close to gobbling up all the petri, uh, nutrients. Now, I have just alluded to it, but it is quite true that as the technologies you've heard about today are implemented in this system, and not simply technologies and more efficient solar cells, but things like working teleoperated on the moon rather than having 6,000 people up there in our baseline model, 
you can bring the front end cost of this system down to where you don't even want to talk about it in public. Thank you. Thank you, David. I think in keeping with our tradition, um, we will uh, take one question before um, this room is turned into a vacuum and we all get sucked out. Um, Dave, you could uh, pick the question. I see actually only one hand up. Martin, um, um, one question. One advantage of the, of the LSP system that occurs to me that you didn't actually mention is it avoids since you've got your, got your uh, main sort of infrastructure sighted on the moon, it avoids the space uh, junk problem, which um, might seriously ser seriously affect um, um, the um, um, the ordinary S S P S uh, concept, which course, hasn't been mentioned at this conference. Yeah, the, uh, everybody probably heard it, but the, the guts of the question are, we have to worry about orbital debris, debris and orbit around the Earth. How is that in a trade of orbital, Earth orbital SPS versus this lunar approach? I, I think that's one of the, there are several dominant issues in making this selection, that's one of them. Orbital debris is already a worry. Uh, and we have almost no surface area in space. The more surface area we put out there, uh, the more debris we're going to have. And that could be debris that occurs because something blows up, or it could be because a uh, meteor stream comes by and starts knocking out parts of the satellite, and then they go in the orbit, or they go in the different orbit, and the acceleration that occurs. Uh, this is enough of a worry that in 1999 there will be a reduction and the number of people allowed in the U.S. in orbit because of the leading uh, meteor stream. Uh, the, the overall issue is that you could make it impossible to travel from Earth out into space because of the group problems. And I think that's going to essentially put a limit, a very low limit, on how much SPS capacity or air, total air that you put in space. And it'll put a very high capacity uh, I want to thank everyone for coming to the SPS session. Um, hopefully, uh, a couple of ISDCs from now, uh, maybe we'll have some hardware or we can actually visit the red antenna. Uh, so, let's uh, everybody get to work. Uh, and again, I urge you at 5 o'clock, check on Ballroom B to see if we indeed are going to get into the tower meeting yet. Thanks again. And if they're not in Ballroom C, you can come to my slideshow at Ballroom A. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>